<clears throat> Hello, welcome to Clagan's webinar on EU batteries, Russian steel and Canadian forced labor. My name is Tim Holt. I'm the operations manager at Clagan. I've been with the company for over 10 years now and working in sort of the conflict mineral space and the corporate social responsibility space that entire time. So without any more wait, let's get down to it. We have a fairly packed agenda today, so lots to go through. Uh, the first thing I want to talk about, we'll spend a few minutes talking about us, about Clagan as a company, and specifically with a view to understanding our role in conflict minerals and the corporate social responsibility space. I just want to sort of set the context for our extensive knowledge and experience in this area so that it sort of helps frame the rest of the presentation. And then we're going to get into the core topics. Now, I'll warn you right up front, the EU battery section is going to be by far the longest. This is the sort of major topic of conversation today. We are going to, I'm going to go over all of the minerals that are in scope, the, go over the various environmental and social categories, and then also, importantly, some strategies on how to, to, to handle this situation, how to address it. There's, there's lots of different things we can do. I want to help sort of point you in the right directions so that you're focusing where you can be most effective. Uh, then we'll, we'll do a sort of a mineral spotlight, as I call it. And we're going to look at each of the four metals, each of the four minerals in scope and, uh, and sort of spotlight on different places around the world where those minerals are mined so that we can kind of look at some of the different types of issues that are sort of all part of the conversation of the sort of EU battery regulation. So we, it's, this is a good way of sort of just seeing the, the different types of the various ways of looking at all of this. So we'll do all of that. And, and, and then I say that'll end with the strategies as well. Then we'll move on to Russian steel. We'll look quickly at the legislation and impact. And then I'll describe some strategies to you again, sort of for how to deal with that. Uh, and then finally, we're going to round things out looking at Canadian forced labor. Uh, these are the, and we'll look at sort of the requirements and deadlines. Uh, the deadline, it may be sooner than, you, than you're hoping. So it's definitely important that's on your radar. And again, I'll talk about some strategies as well. So how, how you can meet those requirements uh, as effectively and as efficiently as possible with hopefully a lot of what's already in place within your company's system. So Clagan's experience, uh, we have been involved in sort of the conflict minerals and corporate social responsibility umbrella uh, for many years. In fact, we go back to before uh, conflict minerals was fully in place. We testified to U.S. Congress when it was uh, Dodd-Frank was under consultation. We are mentioned 18 times in the SEC final rule on conflict minerals. Uh, so as I say, we, we're there from the very beginning in all of this, but we've, we've been continuing and growing and expanding our expertise in these areas over that past decade as well. So we were the first uh, company to identify gold refiner sourcing from the covered countries. This may not be, uh, some of you may not be aware of this, but back in the sort of the 2013 filings, the very first filing, filings that were due, we'd hear all these ex uh, expressions from companies that were working to saying, well, nobody knows which gold refiners are sourcing from the conflict minerals and that to correct them and say, well, no, we do. We, we've done the research. We have this information. We've been doing the research ourselves. And every year since then, we do this sort of annual review, this annual update, a full RCY, reasonable country of origin inquiry, data collection. And this, and this as data collection, it's really, it's research looking at the sourcing of all of the three TG smelters, tin, tantal, and tungsten, and gold, as well as cobalt and mica processors. And we're also expanding into EU batteries while this year. So th this, is, this is a growth and extension of what we've been doing. Clegan was also the ones we, I gave a webinar just about two years ago now at the outset of the Russian invasion of Ukraine, where I identified the problems that this is going to uh, this is going to occur in the mineral supply chain. So I, get, I gave a webinar then talking about it and some of those exact issues we'll be talking about today when we talk about Russian steel. So 
uh, you know, why do I tell you all of this? Because we've been pointing these things out sort of ahead of, we've been ahead of the curve on so much of this, and we've been pointing this out so that you can be prepared. And our clients that work with us regularly, I mean, we do point them out very, even earlier with them because we're having these ongoing conversations with them. And, and as a final point I'll bring up, we were the first to identify refiners sourcing from Xinjiang, which is directly relevant to the, the Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act. Now, the EU, uh, in, in all of their benevolence, they, I, they've agreed to provide some battery guidelines. Now, to, to, to understand the first report, the first filing is due August 18th of next year, so about a year and a half away. And, and thankfully, the EU has decided to publish guidelines starting in February of next year, so just, just under a year away which, uh, you know, any of you working in this, I, I think you're, you can think that uh, six months is the perfect amount of time that you need to have this full guideline in place and you'll have everything you need. Uh, no, not really. That's, this is not ideal whatsoever. Uh, you want to get ahead of these guidelines. You, this six months is clearly not going to be enough time. You want to lay the groundwork for this ahead of time. So that when the EU publishes their guidelines, then you can sort of adapt and modify what you need. But if you're starting from scratch next February, good luck getting in place for next uh, for six months later. We, anybody that's worked in conflict mills, you know how difficult this is. And this is a first time program for everyone. This is going to be more difficult. And, and it's, it's, it's uh, and just because it's new. So absolutely, you at least want to lay the groundwork, prepare ahead of time. Okay, there are four minerals in place here uh, that we're looking at, cobalt, nickel, lithium, and, and natural graphite. There is a synthetic graphite, which is technically not in scope because it's not, it's produced in a lab, it's not mined uh, in a mine. Really, what's one of the things that's going to be important here is, is industry having standard lists of these processor names, right? And everybody that's worked in complex minerals or cobalt or mica, understands this problem uh, and, and how important it is to have these standards and name. So because if you, your suppliers and customers are not talking this, uh, the same language, uh, then it's hard to have uh, to, to, to keep communication going smoothly. You want to have these proper naming conventions and, you know, and, and, and when you're looking at these processors. So the, the, uh, thankfully, the RMI, the Responsible Minerals Initiative, already has a good grasp on cobalt processors. They've been looking at this for years. Clagan, we've been sort of looking ahead and we've already identified some 400 lithium, nickel and graphite processors. We're, we're, we've been paying attention to this in preparation. So certainly if anybody's looking into this themselves and they want to sort of compare lists or talk to us about that, we've already got a very good understanding of what's out there and, and we can kind of help people narrow their list down. We have a lot of experience in this field. Now, when we're taking these four minerals, it's not as, as narrowly defined as something like Dodd-Frank, where it says, okay, we want to look at the sourcing of the of conflict minerals from the DRC and the nine adjoining countries. As it's really, a, that's a fairly limited scope. What we're talking about here, it's something completely different. This is on a whole other level. There are, there are environmental categories and there are also some social categories that we'll look at in a minute. But these environmental categories, just kind of going through them. So we have, you know, uh, you have to consider air and then this means including air pollution and greenhouse gases. Now consider the, the particulates that gets into the air during mining or, or the pollution that can occur from processors downstream, uh, these types of things are in scope and, and we'll look at a few at some clear examples of this in a bit uh, water you see here pollution usage and access so this really encompasses very different different aspects of water and, and where this is going to come into play in particular are things like the tailing ponds and other byproducts from the mining process uh, those if they get into the water they can cause serious damage or the release of chemicals during processing as well uh, we've seen these types of issues before and, and the, the, the damage they can do to the, to the environment and the use of water as well. Some lith lithium processing, some forms of lithium processing are very water intensive. And I will speak about that in a few moments. Soil pollution, again, so 
pollution, erosion, and usage. Now, this is really, I think, tied together with the water. Any kind of breach at a tailings dam or something similar, uh, the, the chemicals can leach into this, the water just as much as they can leach into the soil. Uh, I'll, I'll recall one example. This is a Canadian example, uh, Mount Polly Mine uh, that occurred back at August 4th, 2014. A tailings pond, uh, there's a breach and there's a loss of about 17 million cubic meters of water and 8 million cubic meters of tailings and materials that leached out into the environment that went into the lakes. Absolutely devastating. So these are the types of risks that you're going to need to keep in mind and, and that you'll be reporting on. And then that leads quite naturally into biodiversity, the habitats and wildlife in Florida. You know, if, if, if the, the water and the soil are severely polluted or impacted in some way, that's obviously going to have a knock-on effect on the plant life as well as the animal life that live in that area. Uh, now, hazardous substances, again, this is really you want to be thinking about considering the waste and the byproducts from mining, but also the harsh chemicals that are sometimes used to process and refine minerals. And then even noise and vibration. I, I, I'm, I'm going to guess that this is probably not near the top of any of your lists for things that you would be thinking about when looking at the processing and mining of minerals, but the EU has included even things like noise and vibration. Thinking about how the noise can impact communities as well. And then plant safety. So we've already talked about dangerous chemicals you know, that can be used in the processing of plants. So plant safety as well. Uh, energy use, uh, energy use. So we have this obvious drive to, to ditch oil and use electric cars. This is something that's been growing over, the, over many, many years now. But at the same time, we can't be blind to the fact that these minerals require vast amounts of energy to produce, right? So the EU wants companies even to be thinking about that as well. And then waste and residues. Again, this is really coming down to like the, the tailings ponds and the, the processing byproducts. These are going to be your prime concerns here. So all of these things companies need to be considering about. Now, remember, this is only for the cobalt, nickel, graphite, and lithium that are in your battery. So it's not across your entire supply chain. It's only the supply chain of your battery. So in that, from that perspective, it is a limited scope. Of, of the materials in your supply chain that are in scope, but then you've got to look at this much larger group of topics to account for. And then similarly, we have these social risk categories, so occupational health and safety. Again, this is going to come down to things like chemicals produced, uh, but, but any kind of accidents that happen in the mine site, and, and that can be an issue with uh, artisanal mining in particular. Uh, the, you know, safety is always a concern there. Uh, but, it, but it can happen all the way through into the processing as well. And then we got here something like child labor. Now, this is, uh, this is an issue that's primarily a concern for the mine sites, for our, again, for artisanal mining. And I will spend some time talking specifically about an example of that today. Similarly, forced labor. Again, this is a, an issue that takes place more at the mines, and, and we will be talking about that. And in fact, this is going to lead into the, this is also going to get called up again at the end of our webinar today because we're going to talk about the Canadian forced labor uh, law as well. Then we have uh, oh, uh, discrimination as well, discrimination against people, trade union freedoms, and, and these are ultimately come down to sort of respect for workers' rights and, and respect for the person. And, and then finally, community life, including indigenous peoples. So, you know, it's, it, it's, it's a common issue in, in, in some countries where mining is taking place, especially of the minerals that we're talking about, they do not yet have strong legal protections for people that live on their land. And so one thing we see time and again is there's a failure to consult local populations. There can be, you know, a, a, about what's happening and about the prospect of them being moved. There's a failure to provide adequate comp con uh, compensation, you know, either money or accommodations. Uh, and, and, and sometimes, uh, you have to consider the consequence of the pollution on the communities. And we'll, we'll talk more about this, but when there's widespread pollution caused by mining or processing, that affects community life and including indigenous people, that affects the people directly. And these are, are have to be considered. Okay, let's get more specifically into the legislation itself. The, the good thing about this, at least I'll say, although this, that, that there's a lot of things to consider, 
the way the EU wrote this law is that it is largely built around the OECD due diligence framework, the, their guideline for conflict minerals. So, and, and if any of you are not familiar with that, that's about uh, where they trace minerals and it's, it's learning how to trace minerals in the supply chain and identify risks and, and respond to those risks, mitigate those risks. Uh, you know, and, and Clegan's work, we, we work in this space. Our, our, the work we do, the RSUI work we do, you know, is it conforms with the OECD due diligence guidance as well. This is so th that's what that guidance is, and, and thankfully, the EU battery legislation very much follows that process. By the way, you'll see here uh, some of this blue text here where I have chapter seven. That, that is a link. You know, very much I want you to be uh, to come away hopefully of, of link, having learned more about these topics and get a, a better appreciation for the types of challenges that are involved. But I also want you to learn more outside of that. I don't want you just to take my word for it. You know, feel free to look for it. Um, you know, there's there's homework that came with this with this webinar sign up. I don't know if you realize that. I've assigned you all homework. It's your choice whether or not you want to follow through with it, but it is there for you. So you'll see throughout these slides, there are links and, and the stories I'm talking about, I'm directly linking so that you can read these stories yourself. Uh, in this case, this is just a link to the legislation itself. Um, a little on the dry side, but you know, it's, it's important stuff to read. Okay, so the, the, the EU battery legislation has to say it follows the OECD five steps. Everybody, if you've been working in conflict minerals, you're probably familiar with the term, the five steps. The way, uh, the, the way the EU wrote it up is that really they combined OECD steps one and two into article 49, and then articles 50, 51, and 52 our OECD steps three to five. Now, I'll spend a minute now, we can look, take a bit of a deeper dive, particularly into article 49, that's where it's OECD steps one and two. The reason why, I mean, any of you that are working in the conflict mineral space, you probably understand and know that the vast majority of work, of effort level required to comply with the OECD due diligence guidance, it takes place in steps one and two. They, I, they, they, you know, step three has the risk mitigation. Yes, that's important too, but but it's really the, the core work happens in steps one and two. So let's just dive a little bit further into that. So let's say closely follow steps one and two uh, for the EU battery. So things like that you'd be familiar with, policy communication to customers and to suppliers. You're going to need a policy that's in place uh, to handle this now that policy could be uh, it could be an adapted conflict minerals policy that sort of speaks to to all the, the the minerals in your supply chain or perhaps you you might want to borrow the same language you have for your conflict minerals policy and and create a separate battery specific one that that's a possibility too uh and 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 one of the core things i'm going to be sort of talking about today one of the core advice i have is a lot of these things we're talking about there are similar parallels, parallel legislation that you're probably already addressing. So my advice is to take the, the knowledge you have gained already by working on these and apply them, adapt them, modify them as needed, but don't reinvent the wheel here. You, you, don't, you don't need to do that. Apply what you, you've learned to, to, to do this, to handle this more efficiently and more effectively. So, so yes, in here we have the policy communication. The internal team structure, right? We, we've talked about that, and, and uh, or the, you, you've seen that already in conflict minerals if you're working in that space, this internal team structure. And again, it could very well be that the same people in your organization, and perhaps you're the ones that are, that are listening in on this webinar, the same people that are working in that space uh, uh, for conflict minerals are also the ones that are going to, that are going to do this for EU batteries. So you already have the infrastructure in place and you want to apply, you want it to closely line as much as possible, uh, what you're doing for conflict minerals and apply it to EU battery. Now, some other companies, they may want to do it differently. They may want need different people to, to take over those things. But again, my advice is still take what you know and apply it, adapt it. So, so take that infrastructure, all those good things. The policies that the, the, the internal programs you have apply them to eu battery don't don't start from scratch you don't need to now they also in article 49 part of it and if you know this from step two the oec due diligence guidance it's really about the country of origin it's tracing the source of your minerals 
And the way they phrase it, it's, I, I don't know how realistic it is, to be honest, but they, they ask for, they want to trace the country of origin from mineral extraction all the way to immediate supply, sort of as if they want and, and everything in between. I don't know how realistic this is. Companies do not like publishing their supplier lists. I just, I don't think it's going to happen the way it, it appears to be written. But okay, fair enough. But if you can't publish the entire supply chain mapping, and I, I don't think anybody really wants to do that, then, then you still want to make sure that you are providing as much good sourcing data as possible. Okay, so you still need, you still want to be able to address this as well as you can without, you know, publishing uh, all of your su your supply chain mapping. And, 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 and here's the thing, SEC issuers in, you know, in the, the US have been able to, I think, get away in some of their filings of, of when it comes down to talking about specifically, do they source uh, directly from the, the cover countries? There's some language that they've been able to use in there to kind of wiggle around a little bit. I mean, that, that's, that, that often happens with legal writing. With EU battery, I don't know if they have that same luxury. It's 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 because it's got this larger scope to it. It doesn't. It's it can't be crafted in quite the same way. And and to go along with that, the the the, the country board, like I say, is important because the EU also wants you looking at whether or not there's the processors are sourcing from cars from conflict affected and high risk areas. And so you need this full RCOI data, the, this, this entire sourcing information, in order for you to be able to complete this work. And the data needs to be as you know, specific as possible, as accurate as possible, and up to date. This is, this is something that you have to do on an annual basis. So, uh, and, and what they say, if processors do not have a third party cert, and they source from the cars, from the conflict affected and high risk areas, so that's not just the covered countries, that's, that's a, on a global scale, then additional steps are required. They want locations of mines and locations of consolidation of materials and that sort of thing. So they want more and more data uh, and they, they want companies reporting on that information. Okay. Hopefully that's a, a, a bit of a bit, you have a bit more of an understanding of the types of things you need to be looking at. Now I'm going to walk through and take an example or two from each of the four minerals and we can kind of look at a bit of a risk profiling for each. Each mineral can be sourced from different countries, can have different problems associated with them. So I kind of want to just give you a variety of different things you can think about uh, to, to kind of get you to help frame your mind, help focus on the different types of things that could could come up in your work on this. So some of the risks that can be that might come up are child labor for cobalt. And we'll spend a moment talking about that. Community life, noise and vibrations, that sure, and and occupational health and safety. Um, you'll notice too. I got so what I have at the bottom here the list of countries. The, these are the top three producing countries for the mine for mined cobalt in 2023. This is, comes from the USGS, the US Geological Survey. First thing, obviously, you'll see here, DRC absolutely dominates this, uh, dominates cobalt production. 74% of, of uh, the world's cobalt comes from the DRC. But what you'll notice too, and I, I did want to leave up, Russia is there in, uh, at, in third place at 4%. I'm not going to focus on Russian cobalt. But I do want to just draw your attention to that for all those companies that are looking at Russian material in the supply chain and wanting to get that out of the supply chain, even something like cobalt, you know, it, it, Russia is part of that equation. It's not a large part, but it is definitely there. It is a consideration. There are cobalt processors in Russia as well. So these are, you will kind of have to think about this. And this is a common thing when you're doing work in this space, you might find one problem and notice that you've, you've, you know, you're researching one problem and then you find another parallel problem or another tangential problem that you need to address as well. Uh, that, that may not be for that regulation, but for another one. So bear in mind, and this will come up a few times with the, the Russian source material. And that will kind of lead up to when we talk about Russian steel. One more thing about the DRC though, and the mining in the, and the processing, or sorry, yeah, mining in the DRC. Estimates are that somewhere between 10 and 30% of DRC mining is ASM, when that stands for artisanal and small scale mining. So this is mining with sort of very basic tools, 
that very little sort of safety and oversight. It's it's a it's a much different uh, much different system than one you might think of as a, from an industrial mind. Very much more rudimentary in process and tools and safety. So somewhere between ten and thirty percent of DRC cobalt mining is ASM. Think about those numbers for a second. 10% of the DRC's mining still is about 7% of the world's cobalt production. That puts them more or less on par with Indonesia, number two in the world, Indonesia. ASM mining in DRC is equivalent to about the mining in Indonesia. And that's on the lower end of that, of that estimate of 10 to 30%. If we take the higher end at 30%, that gets us around 21, 22%. That pretty much puts us uh, in line to match the rest of the world's cobalt production combined. Okay, so this is a staggering amount of cobalt that, uh, that the world's cobalt is mined uh, by ASM miners in the DRC. And, and, and really that's going to come up here. I'm gonna spend a few minutes talking about issues that arise from the ASM mining as well as the LSM, the large scale mining. First though, let's talk about ASM. The, the primary concern that's gonna be applicable to your EU battery uh, is child labor. And anybody that's been working in this space probably knew that that's where I was going to go with this. Uh, but it's, it's really, it is worth talking about. Now, child labor, at a, at a cobalt mine in the DRC, this, this occurs, the reason why this occurs is when parents don't make enough money to feed their family or they can't pay for schooling and so they can't leave their kids at home alone, the parents bring them to work. And they don't, parents don't send their kids or say bring their kids to the mines out of greed. This is absolutely, has nothing to do with greed. This is done out of necessity. This is done for, for self-preservation of uh, preservation of life. And, and that this is the unfortunate truth about child labor and, and cobalt mines. And, and here's the, you know, here's the thing. By simply removing the child for, children from the mines, that does not mean the, the actual problem, the root cause has gone away. They might leave the, the cobalt mine, but they might go to other industries, or sometimes they just go to other cobalt mines that aren't being watched as heavily, where, where it can be even more dangerous for them, or they may get, get moved to other industries where it's more difficult to help them. Uh, the focus of some NGOs, and I'll highlight uh, the NGO impact and their program, Career Security, this has been to boost, the, the idea behind them is to boost the economic power of parents, especially the mothers, so they can afford to feed their kids independently and keep their kids in school. Right? So if, if the parents can do that and, and, and survive and, and take care of their kids, they don't want them in the mines. They'd much rather they be well fed and go into school. And, 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 and what, what love, loving parent wouldn't want that for their children? So this is, this is why attention on the root cause of child labor, and this will come up again. We'll talk about uh, Canadian forced labor at the end, and I will sort of touch upon this at the end. But really, we should be thinking about the, the knock-on effects of removing a child from a cobalt mine when the only reason they're there is out of desperation, right? And, and don't get me wrong, this is by no means a defense of child labor. But simply removing the child does not address the root cause of child labor. So yes, we want to remove the children from the mines, but the root cause is the parent's financial security. And so these are the types of issues. And really, this is the, the, an example of the thoughtfulness that is required to properly address the challenges that you're going to have to, to, to face to file these, this EU battery report. These are the types of things we should be thinking about. And, and you know, Banning cobalt from the DRC, that absolutely is not going to, to work. That's going to make the situation for the miners worse. And let's be honest, on a practical level, it would be difficult, if not impossible, actually trying to cut out DRC cobalt from the supply chain. They, they produce three quarters of the world's cobalt. So I, absolutely, that is not the approach anybody should be taking. The goal here is to make money more sustainable uh, and just not exploitative. And then on the other hand, we got large scale mining. So this is somewhere between, what do we say, about 70 to 90% of DRC's cobalt mining is large scale mining. And what I wanna focus on here is, is a completely different issue than child labor. This is about community displacement. So community displacement, what I mean by that is 
Uh, imagine a, a mining company wants to come in and they want to build a new mine. It just so happens that where they want to build that mine is where your house is. And so and you and your neighbors are going to be displaced. Your houses are ultimately going to be destroyed and you're going to have to move somewhere else. That is community displacement. Uh, and I think nowhere has been more uh, prevalent than in Kowasi in southern uh, a mining city in southern DRC has faced multiple waves of forced relocation. And, and when this happens, some of the complaints that people make about this is, first of all, they say they're forced to sign legal contracts that they don't understand. And, and then they're not allowed to have their own copies of it. So they sign this document, they give away their rights, they don't understand fully what they've given up, what they've given up. And then they don't even have a copy to read later to help better understand or to talk to somebody else to explain it to them. They don't even get the copies of these documents. There are also reports of military backed destruction of houses and, and quite literally there are reports of, of the military setting houses on fire. Sometimes when people are still inside those houses, I mean, this is, this is absolutely disgusting behavior that th these reports it's, it's, it's absolutely heartbreaking that these things happen or, or the same, uh, a burning of crops. Imagine, burning burning perfectly good crops in a place where food scarcity is such a concern, right? And, and yet these are the types of tactics that can take place in community displacement. Uh, and other times there are cases uh, where you know, they talk about grossly inadequate compensation. When pay, so they do, they, sometimes they, they will pay them, but they just don't pay them anything nearly reasonable enough. And so they lose their homes. They didn't have enough money to buy another home. So what do you do? Where do you go? Right? These, these, are, these are displaced and they just don't have what they need. This, they're just not being taken care of in, in any kind of equitable, equitable manner. And then there are other cases too, where sometimes new housing is provided. So you're like, okay, well, this sounds good. Like this is, these are good steps, but then they're missing basic elements like running water and electricity. And you can be sure that that brand new mine, the mining company built, it's got its electricity, but then they don't sort of uh, pass on some of these sort of benefits as well to the people. So. Again, it's just, it's, a, it's about, about sort of fair compensation and, and, and helping to improve the lives of people uh, rather than just sort of taking from them, just take, 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 uh, actually trying to help benefit these people. So again, when you're thinking about your, your EU batteries report, these are the, some of the types of things you'll want to consider. And you'll need to understand that these problems exist so you can address them. Okay. Uh, let's move on to nickel now. So uh, the mineral number two we'll look at today is nickel. Now, some of the risks here can include indigenous people's rights, and then in particular, water pollution, community life, biodiversity. Uh, we have here, so here are the top three producing countries. Indonesia coming at a nice even 50% of the world's nickel production in 2023. Uh, Philippines at 11%, and look who it is again in number three, Russia. So again, I'm not going to talk uh, talk much about Russian nickel, but they are, they may not be dominant in the nickel space, but they are still a player. They are, they still have to be considered. A side note: the UK is the only country to have placed sanctions on Russian nickel at this time. Uh, the US has placed sanctions on Russian nor nickel. Uh, nor nickel is the company. Uh, not, not and they not placed the sanctions on the company itself but on the president, Vladimir Putin, And so we so said, while they don't apply to the, the company now, we've all seen over the past two years how, how the West and its allies have been you know, adding more and more sanctions against Russian entities. So it's not to say this couldn't be a problem six months or a year down the road where, where there, there are heavier sanctions going in place beyond just the UK. Okay, but so we, we won't talk uh, about that. Where I do wanna focus your attention uh, for this, we'll do a spotlight on nickel in, in Indonesia and Philippines. I mean, this is, uh, you know, so, so over 60% of the world's nickel comes from these two countries. Uh, it's, it's worth looking a little deeper here. And, and this time we're going to look at more of a, a human health and environment concern. So you see, I have satellite images from Google Maps of the Coral Bay Nickel Corporation uh, in, the, uh, in the Philippines, near Rio Tuba. You'll see near the top left that sort of largest ruby colored uh, feature in the landscape there. That is a tailings pond. That's 
well over a kilometer in diameter. You, you honestly, you need to zoom out pretty far before that tailings pond is no longer visible on Google Maps. It's it's really quite stunning, uh, just just how big it is. And don't get me wrong, I'm not alleging that there are any deficiencies with tailings pond with this particular tailings pond. Um, but when we're talking about evaluating the risks, we need to consider the potential impact on air and water and soil and wildlife and, and human health. And that a, a disaster at a place like this could have on the local community. What the EU is saying by, by requiring companies to look into this is that responsibility is shared across the supply chain. The nickel may come from here. You, you may produce a, a battery or you, you may produce a, 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 a product that contains a battery. But what the EU is saying is you're not exempt from responsibility if some of those materials were mined in a way that's that's sort of uh, detrimental to the local populations where that nickel mine is located. That's really what it's about. Now, when it comes to some of these these mines and these these regions in the Indonesian Philippines, there are reports of things like coughs and, and respiratory illnesses and skin lesions and, and loss of food security and destruction of rainforest. I mean, look look on the satellite imagery, look around that map. That's, that's nothing but beautiful rainforest all around it. And, and even some of these areas have been, uh, and, and, and these, these um, symptoms have been linked to hexavalent chromium. Anyone who's ever seen Aaron Brockovich knows all about the effects of, of hexavalent chromium. And this is anybody that works in the restricted material space. This is, this is the substance that's at the heart of California Proposition 65. So, uh, you know, there, there, some dangerous chemicals can get out there and can impact people. Okay, keep this image in your mind of this very large red tailings pond as we move to the next slide. This is in Pomala in Indonesia. And here, uh, this is a picture of a farmer's field flooded with red mud. This is near uh, a mining area that's partially owned by Vale, a company that uh, has been linked to, to other floods and spills and that sort of thing. Um, so that's what's happened here. So here, I mean, here's the thing, things can and do go wrong even when the best intentions are in place, right? So, but these are risks. These are risks that exist in a supply chain. And these are risks that exist in the supply chain of batteries. And these are the types of things companies will have to consider. And, and to make matters worse, the, you know, at the same time that, you know, you see, read these reports about the, the environmental impact of it, you also, there are also reports about demonstrators quite fairly complaining that these things are happening in, in where they live and they get, and they can sometimes be arrested or attacked when they complain. Imagine just for a second, the hopelessness of the situation when you know something is so absolutely wrong with the area where you live. And if you complain, you might get sent to jail or you might be attacked. So these are the types of things if companies have to talk about how they try to mediate the earth, how to sort of handle these uh, risks, address these risks, uh, they might need to be putting pressure on local governments to have stricter laws in place to help prevent these issues. Okay, so these, again, this is an example of the types of things companies may need to consider when they're filing uh, their, their reports for e-battery. Let's look at lithium next. So some of the, the uh, issues here can have to do with indigenous people's rights or forced labor and the use of water in particular, but pollution as well. I have listed three countries here, which are the top. We have Australia, Chile, and China. Uh, between the three of them, that's 90% of the world's lithium. Uh, one thing I'll point out uh, with uh, Chile, and you'll see it in the picture down here. Uh, this is just one of many aerial photos uh, a series by the aerial photographer, uh, Tom Hagen. Uh, these are absolutely stunning in that, in that link to Chile there. I have the link to Tom's photos, uh, absolutely incredible stuff here. You know, the, the, his pictures are well worth more than a thousand words, really stunning to see. So you can see the sort of very clear environmental impact of the lithium processing in Chile. Um, one thing that, that comes up from this is, is, 
the vast amounts of water that's needed to produce lithium. The, the, it takes roughly 600,000 liters of water to produce one kilogram of lithium. Uh, when it in, in this particular type of processing, 600,000 liters of water to produce one kilogram of lithium. And people thought almonds were bad. Okay. And more to the point, this occurs in one of the driest places on the planet. Imagine that, that a vast amount of water that's used in one of the driest places on the planet. So when companies uh, you know, need to consider water usage and the impact on local populations, this is the type of thing we're talking about here. These details matter. But that's not going to be my main focus for lithium. Notice China currently in third place with 18%. Where I want to focus is, is China are drastically trying to increase their output of lithium. And one of the places where this is happening in China is in Xinjiang, the Xinjiang non-ferrous metals group. Uh, broke ground just over a year ago on a new lithium mine in Xinjiang. And, and the phase one is that it's going to have production of 75,000 tons a year, but phase two is 600,000 tons of lithium each year. The Xinjiang non-ferrous metals group are known to recruit Uyghurs. So given the US stance on sourcing and mining of material from Xinjiang, uh, that we should assume forced labor is effectively taking place because it'd be so hard to prove otherwise that we have to assume that, that, that the, the forced labor is taking place. Xinjiang's involvement with lithium will pose a major challenge for companies flying with the EU. And then, of course, this creates other problems for companies importing these batteries into the U.S. under uh, when they have to contend with the Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act. OK, so this is exactly the type of thing that needs to be considered. And, and, and Xinjiang non-ferrous metals, they, they, they and, and I have the link to it in there, I'll, I'll warn you, it's, it's in Chinese, uh, so, but you can use any Google Translator similar to translate it for you very quickly, and you can, you can read it yourself. Uh, I'll, I'll warn you, it's, it was one of the darker reads that I had when preparing for this webinar. They, they are effectively boasting about the re-education of Uyghurs that were transferred under their care. They're, they and and here's, that, that they present it in a a positive light, that they are that they are providing all these benefits to these people, but really they are what they're describing is this sort of large scale controlling of their lives and teaching them how to think and what not to think. The the, thing, the thought that came to mind is this is the type of thing George R. Orwell would see and say, well that goes just a little bit too far, and yet this is and and don't just take my word for it. I encourage you to to read it up on it yourselves. But in truth, China is such a major player in the battery space, both in the production of, of materials, but then the production of batteries. Any company with a lithium battery is going to have to contend with these risks in their supply chain. These are the things you're going to have to think about. And while the media have called out some companies, and especially in the auto industry, for making bold claims about everything they will do to prevent child or forced labor in the DRC with cobalt, Yet the media calls them out because the same attention is not currently being provided for something like this, for material that could be mined in Xinjiang. And so really, you know, companies are going to have to expand the area of where they're looking. Okay, rolling along, uh, we're near the end of battery. It's in the EU battery risks. Uh, this has to do with uh, graphite, and this is specifically natural graphite, not synthetic. Uh, the areas here are the risks are with community life and air pollution. The And the countries here, now you'll notice China absolutely dominating the scene here with Madagascar and Mozambique coming in second and third, tied for a second, let's say. Uh, and this is not because China just has more graphite. Graphite is found all over the world. The reason why China is so dominant in this space is because they produce it more cheaply than everyone else. It's just cheaper to get from China than anywhere else. So they kind of locked up that market. And then when we talk about some of the issues though, in a moment, I think you'll understand why this is a problem. So uh, with that in mind, let's look there. Uh, I'm going to refer to an article. This one's a little bit older. It's from the Washington Post, but absolutely uh, an important, important 
article that really does a fantastic job providing uh, that highlighting the the impact of pollution from graphite mining on uh, on on the villages found in Jingxi, China. Um, the way they describe it is that the, you know, the pollution is so prevalent that the air sparkles. Imagine that the air sparkles because there's just that much dust in the air. And and the way they they say is they they they. It's, it's in the air and it coats the village and they find it on their crops when they walk. And, and when they walk through a cornfield, they get the dust on their face. They can feel in their face. It gets into their house and they feel it in their mouths and their teeth when they chew. This is how the villagers describe it. And they say it pollutes the water, leaving a chemical odor that irritates the nose and throat. I mean, just, just imagine what an impact that's having on, this, on this, these poor villagers. And they even the villagers even say, you know, they, they 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 would move if they could, but they don't have the means to relocate. When they complain to officials, they're told, well, listen, the, the, the graphite company, the mining company, is just too big. It's just too big. So what are we gonna do? Uh, so absolutely dire situations there. And and then the, the mining companies, and this is the, the response they gave to the journalists here, they said the production is strictly operated according to the related law and regulation. Wow. I mean, maybe there's maybe there's a problem with the laws and regulations. Then these are again the types of things companies will have to consider, and perhaps the pressures they may need to put on other entities. As difficult as it is to put pressure on on an entity like China, uh, you know, companies will need to use their economic clout to do better. Uh, and and then there are also sort of harsh chemicals that are used in refining graphite. Uh, that 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 add to the um, you know there, there are cheap there are less harmful ways but they they cost more so they don't get used. So I say these are the types of things companies will need to think about. Now, okay, I apologize. I know this has not been the most uplifting uh, forty minutes or fifty minutes now of your lives. There's been a lot of heavy stuff we've gone over, and and I do thank you for listening. But let's at least focus on some of the positive. What are some of the things that we can do about it? How can we prepare? How can you help meet the objectives of the EU battery? Um, one, you you need a full smelter RCOY. You you need something. Uh, you need lots of details. Listen, we get new clients that come to us every year. Sometimes they're coming, they're doing the work themselves, or they're coming from some of those sort of large software providers that are out there, and they come to us, and and then they see what we do, and when we say RCOY. This full RCY, they see what we mean, and they're always so blown away with what we're providing, how, how our work, it's thoroughly researched and detailed. We do this work ourselves. We do it on an annual basis, and this is the type of information you're going to need if you really want to be able to address these issues. You need country-specific data. But, but if you're ever wondering and you don't work with us, if there are better solutions out there for RCY, yeah, give us a call. I promise you. We, we have exceptional data for our COI data. And what we've done is, we, I mean, we've been taking our well-established process for 3TGs and, and we've just been expanding it, right? And this is, I say in 2019, we started looking at cobalt. If you need help with cobalt, we have that uh, with mica. We've been doing that since 2022. And, and then now we're expanding into nickel, lithium and graphite. So if you need that, that more, that next level detail of our COI, that's sort of the stuff we work on. And so we're always happy to have a conversation. Another important one, I already mentioned this earlier, is build off your existing infrastructure. Apply the knowledge you've gained from Conflict Minerals uh, from the OECD due diligence guidance and apply it. Don't try and reinvent the wheel. You've got lots of good things in place. Modify and adapt to the EU battery law. Don't try and start from scratch. I, I say knowledge is power too. You cannot begin to address risks if you don't know about them. So you need to have a full understanding and appreciation of the types of risks that are out there so that you can address them and so that you can report on them to the EU. And then, and then this is, I think, is going to be sort of the most important one here because, you know, some of you may be hearing all this and just be feeling completely intimidated by the burden uh, that's been set forth upon you by the EU. My, my advice here, it's unlikely you're going to be able to do all of this in year one. There, there are too many issues. It's just, it's, it's just too daunting. So my advice to you, pick and choose your battles in year one. Focus where you can make the biggest impact and report on that, okay? Learn from those successes and expand in the following years, okay? Something to build out. At companies that, you know, that were doing conflict military reporting 10 years ago, 
I'm going to start with a very basic report to the to the SEC, and they've learned and they've grown. Take a similar approach to EU batteries, uh, and and this is going to going to require communication through the supply chain, working with your suppliers, working with your customers who are asking you information. Uh, you know, there's going to be lots of education and communication that's required, but but focus where you can make the biggest impact in year one. Okay, uh, I know we're, we've really been spending a lot of time on EU batteries. Russian steel, I promise we'll get through much faster. Uh, what, what I'll say up the, the, up the hop for them, the main thing is that the EU and uh, UK have prohibited the importation of Russian steel. Uh, as the law set it out, uh, it shall be prohibited to import directly or indirectly iron and steel products that originate in Russia or have been exported from Russia. And then they list uh, you know, a series of custom codes, which, which handle more or less everything. You know, this, is, this could be sort of steel ingots that are then gonna be used to, to process in the EU, EU or UK into something else, or it could be things like, like fasteners, screws that are being imported into the EU. They cannot be of Russian origin. Uh, I've listed some of the, the top five countries that produce iron only to show that really Russia is a fairly small player in the production of iron on a global scale. There are four countries ahead of it. The only reason why I point this out is just to show that you know there are lots of other alternatives out there. It shouldn't be as daunting as you might think trying to, re to remove Russian steel from your supply chain. Uh, there are, there are. I mean, look at Australia, nearly 40%. There, there are other sources of steel out there in the world. Well, how are you going to do it? How are you going to prove that your steel is not from Russia? The, I think the key to this, that we, really what we do when we look at this is, is using uh, mill certs. Mill certs for that steel that will identify often sort of the country of manufacture, the melt origin or, or, or country of production, that sort of thing. Um, this is where you're going to get that information. Now, this is something Ideally, you're going to want to get ahead of time before it's a problem. And if you want to start looking at this, reach out to us. We can certainly help. But the key thing here is that your product, you know, if, if, if your products could get held up at the border, and we've talked to companies that have faced this issue, their products get stuck at the border. And I tell you, it's much less stressful. It's much easier to get this information ahead of time than when the products are stopped at the border, are ready to be sold and can't because they're being held up by this. So these are the types of things that you want to, to, to keep in mind. And this, those mill certs are gonna be the real key to, to proving that it's not of Russian origin. So let's talk strategies then. Engage your suppliers early. It's easier to get this information ahead of time. It's possible to do it retroactively, but it's more difficult. It is certainly more difficult, like I said, especially when your products are stuck at a border. You're going to need to track those supplier responses. So, and the way we think of this is really, it's, it's similar to your supplier RCY for Comic Mills, where you're collecting CMRTs, kind of picture it in a similar light for collecting these mill certs and, and cataloging them. Uh, it's similar to how we would handle compound minerals. That's how Plagan looks at this, this uh, addressing this issue. And you also want to be able to account for it that some suppliers may have multiple certs, so you need to be able to account for that as well. Okay, and then the last thing to consider here is that not all certs are created equal. Okay, you may need to educate your suppliers on the required elements for you to demonstrate compliance. So. If, if your, your mill certs don't, some don't have that country, uh, that country information, you might need to educate your suppliers to require that themselves so that you can get the information you need. So keep that in mind. Okay, that was it for, that was it for Russian Steel. I promise that's a fast one. Let's talk about Canadian forced labor. This is all based on, from Bill S211. Uh, what this is, it's really an annual reporting requirement. Here's the kicker. The first one is due in just about three months time, May 31st, starting this year, reporting on the previous financial year. The in-scope entities, there's a couple different ways that you can be captured, you can be caught in this. 
Uh, one, a company listed on the stock exchange in Canada is automatically in scope. And then if a company, if you do business or have a place of business in Canada and you meet two of the following three conditions, uh, the one, have $20 million in assets, two, have generated at least $40 million in revenue, or three, employ an average of at least 250 employees. If you have two of those three and, ha and do business or have a place of business in Canada, then you're in scope as well. And so this is reporting on forced labor in your supply chain. The, the one positive I'll say is, and, and if, if you're doing this level of business in Canada, you're probably doing this level of business in other places in the world. And so you may already have parallel programs in, in, at your organization. So the basis of the reports are similar to modern slavery legislation in the UK, Australia, and California. If you're already writing these types of reports, then you can adapt them to comply with the Canadian law, okay? And in fact, the, the, the Canadian law even says, yeah, you can do this, just make sure that you actually account for any nuances, any differences that may exist between the Canadian law and these other ones. You, you are still responsible for, for, for those differences, for covering them, but yes, absolutely, you can modify and adapt your current ones to meet the Canadian law. The one area where I, I noticed the, the real difference is it has to do with child labor. It's, it's actually a bit, a bit more of an encompassing, a bit more of a nuanced uh, definition of child labor. It's the area, the way they descri um, describe it is labor or services provided or offered by persons under the age of 18. And then, and then there's these four sort of subcategories here. Uh, one are provided or offered to be provided in Canada under circumstances that are contrary to the laws applicable in Canada. What that means? You can't break laws in Canada that are already in place. Okay, that's fair. Uh, number two, uh, that are provided or offered to be provided under circumstances that are mentally, physically, socially, or morally dangerous to them. So it's interesting that actually that they section this out. This actually largely also fits in with the worst forms of child labor convention, uh, but there's a little bit more nuance here. So Canada did sort of pull that out and make it its own point. Uh, number three here uh, to, uh, interfere with their schooling by depriving them of the opportunity to attend school, obliging them to leave school prematurely or requiring them to attempt to combine school attendance with excessively long and heavy work. So it, basically the work cannot interfere with their schooling. Now we talked a, a little bit ago about cobalt and child labor, and you can really see how this is an important provision, how that the loss of education not only impacts the children, but it, imp it, it, it impacts their growth uh, down the line as well. And then there's the worst forms of child labor, uh, which I, I'm going to hope is sort of much less of a concern for anybody that's in attendance. These are things like sale and trafficking of children, debt bondage, things like that. So uh, let's, let's assume that that's not going to be an issue for you. What about the report itself? Entities must report on structure, activities, and supply chains. That's your very typical type of information you provide in, in government reports. Uh, need to, uh, you need to prov uh, describe or provide policies and due diligence processes. Again, that's fairly common stuff. If you're, if you're working conflict minerals, you know you've done that before. If you're working in, in modern slavery or for other uh, regulations, you know about that. You're doing that sort of things already. Um, you also need to address parts of the business and supply chain that are at risk of forced labor or child labor. Now, we've we spent plenty of time talking about how uh, your batteries could absolutely be an area where child labor could be a concern. So that would be an area where you need to talk about that. Or, uh, you know, if it's if it's forced labor, particularly any, any of you that are in sort of the electronic space or that have a sort of production, it's contract manufacturers. The contract manufacturers are one of the most common sources of forced labor in supply chains uh, of sort of produced goods. And then you need to talk about measures taken to remediate uh, forced or child labor, right? So, you know, what have you actually done to try and help fix the problem? And then, and here's, here's a really, a really important one. And I sort of alluded to this earlier. You need to describe measures taken to remediate loss of income to the most vulnerable families impacted by the elimination of forced or child labor. So, and I mentioned this when we discussed child labor and cobalt. Yes, we want to we want to get the children out of the mines, but if we think our responsibility ends there, we're wrong. We we need to build a system that lets parents be financially independent, 
so that they can send their kids to school. They don't need to bring them to the mines, right? So, so Canada is asking you to, to report on that as well. And then uh, employee training within your organization. Okay, that's, that's, that's something you've likely done before as well. And, and then a self-assessment of, of your program's efficiency. And finally, the report must be approved by a governing body. By, sorry, by its governing body. Almost there at the end. Thanks so much for sticking on. Uh, okay, the, another point here, there's a mandatory questionnaire. In addition to submitting the report, entities must complete a questionnaire. The de and what they say is the details must be consistent with the report. Okay, that's fair. Uh, I, I think, I think we'd, we'd all be hoping that would be the case. It's, it's an online portal. It's fairly simple. Uh, you have the ability to walk through the questions before actually submitting. You, you can kind of do like a, a trial going through it if you want to. We've also taken the time to sort of get all the questions out so that we can report, uh, so that we have them sort of all listed out in Excel spreadsheet. If you're interested about that, you, you, you want to take a look at that, we can, we'll happily provide it. Don't, don't hesitate to reach out. Okay, here's where it gets, uh, I don't know, interesting is not really the right word. Let's say surprising. Yes, the goal of rooting out child and forced labor in the supply chain is an admirable goal and everybody is going to be on board with that. What is quite surprising about the Canadian version of this law is how they describe their enforcement. Now I have some of the legal text out there. It's a bit of a, it's a bit of a wall of text, I apologize. But ultimately what it means is a designated person, that means somebody that's working for the government or on behalf of the government, for the purpose of verifying compliance with Canadian forced labor law, they can enter any place, any place, your business say, where they have reasonable grounds to believe there's something in that, in that place uh, that's, that's pertinent to your forced labor, child labor uh, work. And the powers extend to what they say is they can examine any documents on site, they can examine any means of communication, so that's your email, that's your phones, anything where you have the information, any computers are on site, they can look there as well, okay? They have, technically they have legal access to it. They can take photos and make reports to findings. They can prohibit and limit access to all or part of that place, okay? They can block you from parts of your business. They can remove anything for the purpose of examination. And this is some very intensely worded uh, enforcement. And if you're thinking to yourself, oh, well, me, I don't work. Thank God I don't work in the office anymore. I work at home. This is not going to be a concern for me. Well, they've got you covered too. It says if the place is a dwelling or a house, they may enter it without the occupant's consent. Honestly, mind boggling that, that it's written this way. I don't know that this would survive a, a, con a contesting by the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms but yet that is how it is described. I don't bring this up because I want to drum up fear in you, but I do want to make companies aware that these provisions technically do exist. That being said, I don't know that they're gonna use them to the extent with which they're written, but yet somebody wrote these details in there. Somebody wrote them in there. Uh, so we do want to keep these uh, just just to at least be aware of them and, and then punishment as well every person or entity that fails to comply uh, is liable to a fine of not more than two hundred and fifty thousand dollars and every person or entity that knowingly makes or provides false or misleading information is similarly liable to a fine not more than two hundred fifty thousand dollars and any director, officer, or agent, think of that for that governing body uh, that signed off on things can separately be held liable. So this has a surprising amount of teeth to it. Whether or not it's used to the extent with which it's written, uh, it remains to be seen, but those details are there. What about strategies, okay? And thank you so much for sticking on. Strategies for Canadian forced labor, again, uh, as I've been saying before, you want to leverage similar programs. If you've already got your UK modern slavery program set up, adapt it, modify it, make minor modifications to adapt it to for the Canadian forced labor. Uh, it's going, you're going to get there a lot more efficiently and effectively if that's your plan, if you've already got those systems in place. At the same time, a company without a mature modern slavery program within their organization will need to start as soon as possible. I, I can't stress that enough. There's, there's a lot of work to do if you're starting right now you are you 
there's a lot of work to do. I recommend you want to reach out. You may need some help if you're starting from scratch. And the last one, don't forget to submit. May 31st is just around the corner. And conveniently, everybody that's working in conflict minerals, you'll recognize that date is also when your SEC filing is due. Uh, Canadians so helpfully and uh, thankfully made it due the exact same day. Don't forget to submit. And finally, that questionnaire as well. It's a mandatory component. Okay, thanks so much for everybody. Let's, uh, let's see, we still have a few people sticking around. Uh, let's see if we have any questions that we can address. Uh, okay, let me start just looking through questions right now. Uh, so any exemptions for EU battery? No, uh, the, the, the only exceptions were for military and space. Uh, that's what that's come up. Thank you for that question. So uh, oh, any filing or reporting requirements for EU battery? Yes. Yeah, this is an annual report. So in the same way, think of it as this is this is part of your sort of company's profile now, just like conflict minerals has become. Uh, this is this is this is uh, an annual one. So uh, a question about mill certificates on Russian steel. What is the best way to, to tie the given mill certificate to the specific fastener? I mean, really, you, you want to be engaging your suppliers. And, and, and that's why I say you, you want to do that ideally at purchase, right? That's why I say it's much simpler to, and, and more effective to do this at purchase uh, rather than trying to do it retroactively. Uh, ultimately, I think it's a matter of you know, sometimes you got to do the best with what's available, but certainly reaching out to your suppliers, getting that information. I mean, they, your, your supplier fasteners may always be sourcing the same types of, of minerals. Uh, or so there's the same type of steel. So that may be something that you can do is just to keep, uh, is to keep, uh, work, work with them to get the, the information. It may be the same sort of answer from them each time, and that can help you get there. But, but, here, it's, it's going to be communication directly with them to get that information. Okay, everybody, I, I, I've taken up more of your time than I think you may have expected. Thank you so much for all sticking around. Uh, pleasure to host you today. I hope you've learned something. Uh, there, there will be, as I said, an email going out with a PDF where there will be all those links I talked about are going to be available there. And so I encourage you to learn more if you have interest in this space uh, and, and there'll be more coming. Okay, thanks so much, everyone. Take care now.